Grace and peace to you. If you've ever prayed a prayer like this, Lord, help me. Get me out of this situation. What are you doing up there? Can't you see I'm suffering? Remove it. Get rid of it. Rescue me. Or if you ever will pray a prayer like that, this message might be for you. We're going to talk about uh, once you pick up the cross to follow Jesus, today I want to encourage you to keep going. Keep following. Keep carrying the cross. No matter what comes your way, no matter what difficulty, no matter what suffering, no matter what heartache, no matter what relationship, whatever happens to you, you're going to go through a difficult time. And your prayer might be, Lord, rescue me from this situation. And if you're not rescued, then the problem must be with God, right? God can't rescue us, or He would. Or maybe not. So today, is a, the Scripture is from 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And it is Paul writing to the church of Corinth. And Paul is sharing testimony. He's sharing a little bit about his own faith journey. And so he starts the letter out with a little bit of the trouble that's happening in his life. And I'd like to invite you to read this word with me. Our hope for you is unshaken. For we know that as you share in our suffering, you will also share in our comfort. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But that was not to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and He will deliver us. On Him we have set our hope that He will deliver us again. He must also help us by prayer, so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. This is the Word of God for the people then, for us today, and not just for us, but for everyone. And to that we say, thanks be to God. So let me just tell you the context here, what's going on. Uh, this is the first part of it. This is chapter 1. This is an introduction. And one of the things that's similar, this is the second letter to the Corinthians. Which means he had a first letter to the Corinthians. And in the first Corinthians, a letter to the, to the Corinthians, his first letter, there's, there's some similar pieces here. Uh, he talks about how God sustains us in times of difficulty in the first letter. Uh, but now it's kind of, it's a lot more real. There's some stuff going on here. So the bottom of this particular side, for we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength. I think that's important. They weren't strong enough. They had a burden beyond their strength. They, they weren't strong enough to endure whatever it was that they had to endure. So we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. They were facing death. And, and we believe, even in this passage, that what Paul is talking about is they experienced death. Either one of the members of the party had died, or, or they had come across a situation and, and someone who they were ministering to died, but they have experienced death itself, and they have experienced the sentence of death. They've had near-death experiences. And then we have the rescue in the next slide. But God delivered us, and He will deliver us. God did deliver us, and He will deliver us. So if your prayer is, God, deliver me, God, rescue me, God, pull me out of this fire, I don't want to go through this anymore, that's a godly prayer. That's a good prayer. But I'm going to share with you today that that is only half of the prayer. And so often we don't add the second half of the prayer that we need to pray. So the first half is, God, deliver me, or God, deliver us, rescue us. But there's another part of the prayer that we need to pray. But before we get there, let's talk about uh, what some of you are going through. Because last week we talked about deny yourself. So there's some things we need to deny. We need to deny uh, ourselves from drugs and alcohol and sinful practices and, and bad financial decisions. We need to deny ourselves. Because 
we need to take the biblical principles in our lives, apply them, and follow Jesus. So last week was more about denying yourself, and then you pick up your cross and you follow Jesus. Now that we've done that, we want to keep going. We don't want to give up. You, you see, the, the, the Christian faith isn't something you just try. I'll see if this will work for me. It's like, uh, you know, you go to a store and you try on a pair of shoes. Let's see if this works. And then I feel good in the store, and then two weeks later your feet hurt. And you say, these aren't the shoes for me. That's not the Christian faith. The Christian faith is not something you try. The Christian faith is something you live. It's a commitment that you live in Christ, and it's a commitment that God has that God will sustain you in whatever circumstance that you find yourself. So just because your feet hurt doesn't mean you stop. Just because the burden is heavy doesn't mean you stop. Just because you're in a difficult circumstance does not mean you stop. Just because a relationship is going south does not mean you stop. You keep going, you keep following Christ, you keep applying biblical principles, and you don't give up just because there are times of trouble. So, question of the week last week was, tell me something good you're doing that sometimes you want to give up. Certainly we want to give up our bad habits, but what if we got some good things going on? We don't want to give up the good things. So I just wanted to find out from you, what are those good things that you're doing? So, uh, we seem to have a, uh, a school teacher here. About three of them had this answer. Three school teachers. What is it something you're, you want to give up, but it's a good thing that you do? That's what they said. Teaching. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. So I just want to, I just want to thank all the school teachers, all the staff, uh, all those cafeteria workers that feed our kids, thank you so much, and spring break next week. Thank you. Hey, there you go. A lot of grateful people in here. All right. Now, I have to let you know that the, that you guys answered the question of the week before last week's message. And if you remember anything about last week's message, if you were here, one of the things I said is you don't have to wait till you have a heart attack until you start applying healthy habits, all right? So, good eating and exercise. So, someone put, even before they heard the sermon, healthy cooking, because it's so easy to get fast food. Uh, getting up early and going to work and sending the kids off to school. Now, I'm not sure if the sending the kids off to school is a hard thing or just getting them up. We'll let that person. Uh, nurse practitioner school, two months to go. Don't give up yet. So you've got two months to go. Do it. Uh, another exercise. Another exercise. Um, volunteering to work a double shift when my co-worker calls in. Uh, that's a tough one. Another teacher. Uh, volunteering at the hospital. Boy, there's a, there's a lot of folks in our community that give up their time and do a service for us. And uh, bless their hearts. The, the folks at the hospital are wonderful. Uh, they, they, they're in so many different places. And God bless them for doing that. Uh, here's someone who retired and still continues to work part-time for the employer. That's a, I, that's a good thing. Uh, caregiver. I have several of these. Caregiver. Day-to-day caregiver. Uh, one person was taking care of their mom. This person's taking care of a friend. And, and for those of you who are in that situation where you're taking care of someone, uh, God bless you. That's a wonderful thing to do. And it's a not very thankful job. A lot of times the people that we take care of, they get, they get tired of us, too, don't they? <laughs> I mean, it's just as hard for the, for the person being taken care of as it is for the person giving the care. Another uh, dieting. Here's someone says, taking medicine. <laughs> that went along with last week's sermon, too. Exercise. Teaching the two-year-old Sunday school class. Thank you to you and to all of our teachers uh, working the nursery. Thank you. Uh, another caregiver. Getting up early to come to church on Sunday morning. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, for, those of those, for those that forgot to set their clocks, we'll see them in about half an hour. All right. Great, great. So there's some things you're doing. There's good things that you're doing. We want you to keep doing the good things. We want you to give up the bad things. Do the good things. Focus on doing the do's and, and not doing the don'ts kind of takes care of itself. 
but it is, it is a struggle, it is a process, and you have to keep doing it. And so we have, we have the Apostle Paul who, who comes along and he's trying to do the right things, he's trying to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he gets into a lot of trouble and heartache. And we want to say to the Apostle Paul, keep going. And the Apostle Paul tells uh, the churches to keep going, keep your faith, stay strong, uh, rely on God. So, because it is on the way to the cross, I want to share a little bit about uh, the way to the cross that Jesus had. So, I've got a, I have a map for you. And this is a map of Jerusalem, uh, the city of Jerusalem. These are the city streets. Up there in the upper right-hand corner is the Antonio Fortress. That is where the cross was placed upon Jesus. And Jesus had to take that cross. He had to walk through the city of Jerusalem to the place of the skull, which is right outside the city gate, uh, down in the lower left-hand corner. Now it's the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is the Church of the Resurrection. And so the crucifixion and the resurrection all happened right there in the same spot. So he had to walk through that town. And once he had the cross, he had to keep carrying in that cross. And certainly, Jesus can identify with you if you want to give up. And so uh, he walked through those city streets. And then the next one I have is uh, this is a, the model in Jerusalem. They had this, somebody built this huge model. It's absolutely wonderful of how Jerusalem looked in the first century. So to the far right arrow is the temple, in the middle is uh, the Antonio Fortress, and then we had to walk through that city to outside of the picture on the left to Golgotha, the place of the skull where he was crucified. And then uh, another piece of, of this part, uh, there's Holy Rock Cafe. You've heard of a Hard Rock Cafe? There's Holy Rock Cafe. Uh, this is on the Via Dolorosa. The Via Dolorosa is the name of the street where Jesus walked from the Antonio Fortress to the place of the skull. We had the opportunity to walk that path ourselves. And so we walked that path. You can see how, how narrow it is. There's only two people wide. And uh, the, Holy, the Holy Rock Cafe, uh, you can go to that Holy Rock Cafe and you can get you some, some coffee. You can get the, the bottle of soft drink, uh, all, all, you know, American products. Uh, you can get your candy bar and, and crackers. So it wasn't like the Hard Rock Cafe. It was the Holy Rock Cafe. But you get a sense of the tightness of the street. Uh, certainly these, these um, I mean, it was full. You could, you could buy those things. Uh, T-shirts, uh, stars, wooden pieces, trinkets, souvenirs. I mean, everything that you would want, uh, they were selling fruit, anything that you want. And these streets were just both sides. As you go down, they had the shops on both sides. It was the same way in Jesus' day. I mean, Jerusalem was a tourist spot in the first century. People came from all over, especially Jewish people came from all over, to come to Jerusalem to worship, to sacrifice, to present their children, to do their bar mitzvah, which is the coming of age for a, a young man. And when they came, there were people ready to sell them whatever it was that they needed. So this is where Jesus went. Jesus just didn't go down some road that didn't have people on it. It was crowded and full of people. And as he carried the cross, he carried it in these circumstances. There is a phrase, a uh, sentence that we use that I kind of wanted to spell today. If you've ever taken comfort in this, this is not to condemn the... the uh, the phrase itself, or to condemn you for taking comfort in it, it's okay if you have taken comfort in this. But there is something that we say in, in 21st century Christianity, and what we say is when you're going through a difficult time, we'll say, God won't give you more than what? Than you can handle. And I want to share with you, this is not, this is not necessarily biblical, and it's a, it's, it's a weak premise. It's a weak premise. Because it implies two things that just aren't true. The first thing it implies is that God caused this suffering to happen to you. And that because God caused it, He could have made it worse, but you weren't strong enough to handle it. So God gives you just enough for you to handle. So God doesn't necessarily cause all the problems that we have in our lives. Sometimes we cause them ourselves. Sometimes it's the choices we make. Or some, it's a world of free will. Sometimes it's the choice that someone else makes that causes us 
to suffer. I mean, there are, there are choices that are made that cause suffering in the world. Sometimes it's a, someone who's had too much to drink, gets behind the wheel and decides to drive. Certainly that person has caused suffering in the past. There are, there are there's suffering that takes place. And to imply that God caused this kind of suffering is a weak premise. Now certainly, you know, in the grand scheme of things, we believe that God does allow some things to happen, and perhaps God prevents some things to happen so that we don't get more. But to say God won't give you more than, a, than you can handle is something that we say to people in times of crisis, in times of grief, in times of difficult circumstances. And the response might be, well, if I was weaker, would, I, would God have given me less? And, and so it begins to break down. The second, the second thing it implies that is just absolutely false is that you are strong. And I want to say to you that that is a false premise. You are not strong. You are human. And because you are human, you have shortcomings. You are mortal. You have limitations. And you are weak. Now, we might have some strength in us, and we might be able to do some, some things that make us stronger than somebody else, or there might be someone stronger than us. But we are not strong, and we are not going to go through this life with the strength we need to handle every circumstance. No matter of fact, the opposite is true. We are a weak individual. And there's going to be something, if it hasn't already happened to you, there's going to be something that's going to happen to you that you will not be able to handle. And for someone to come up to you and say, you just need to be strong, that's not going to get it. And so if that's a false premise, what's the right way to look at things? What's a biblical way to look at things? What's the right perspective of God? And what's the right perspective of God? us as humans. And so we go back to 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. We go back to this letter, this, these letters of encouragement for the people of faith to continue the walk, to not give up in the most difficult of circumstances, even to the point of death, when they're being persecuted for even confessing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, when they're experiencing suffering, their homes are being taken away from them because they're following Christ. Some of them are being killed because they're following Christ. And certainly, prayer might be, Lord, rescue me from this situation. But over and over again, their, their brothers and their sisters in Christ are finding their way to be persecuted and killed. And there is no rescue there. So for us to stop at that sentence, and if we are not rescued, we must then decide either God is not strong enough, God is not willing, God does not care, because God did not rescue us. So we go back to the night before the cross was put on the back of Jesus. And we go to the prayer of Jesus, and we try to find in the prayer of Jesus how we might pray. And the prayer of Jesus has two parts. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he says, Lord, rescue me. Now, those are my words. His words are, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Get me out of here. Get me out of this. That's the first part. So this, to pray that is a biblical prayer. To pray that, I'm not condemning anyone to ever pray, to ever pray for rescue or deliverance from God. Because certainly there are times when we can pray for deliverance and we are delivered. We can pray to be rescued and we are rescued. We can pray to have this situation in our lives taken away from us and be removed. And there are times when it will be taken away from us and it will be removed. But there are times it will not be. And so we need the second half of the prayer. Lord, not my will. But yours be done. The prayer of surrender. And so, what ha- begins to happen in the New Testament with Paul and James and the apostles is they begin to help us in our prayer life. They begin to help us how we need to pray. They need to help us 
what we need to do and what we have in this wonderful letter to the Corinthians, this second letter to the Corinthians, is Paul gives his personal testimony. He says, this is what's happening to me. We, we experience death. We experience the sins of death. We experience near-death experiences. We, we, have these, we have these horrible things happen to us. And he, and he goes on to, to share some more stuff. He's been beaten with rods. He's been stoned to death or stoned and left for dead. He, he's been shipwrecked and thrown to the sea. He's had riots because of him. He got thrown out of cities. And at any point you might think, Paul, I mean, what would your advice be to him? Paul, maybe this isn't the part you're supposed to take. Things aren't going real well. We just need to give this up. We need to stop this. This shoe isn't working for you. You need to try on a different shoe. But whenever Paul experienced suffering, he kept going. Because he had a faith in God, and he believed, and this is where we go back to, to the first letter, chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. God will sustain you. He says it in a second as well. God will sustain you. You're not relying on his strength to get him through. God will sustain you. God will get you through it. And so, we continue on in, in 2 Corinthians 1, and he shares some other stuff, and then we get to chapter 12. He's, he's nearing the end of his letter. And he shares with us a prayer that he prayed. And the prayer was, God, get me out of this. Take this away. Now, his words are, he had a storm in the flesh, and he prayed three times, God, take it away. Remove it. Get rid of it. I don't want it anymore. It's more than I can bear. Right? But God did not remove it. But God did speak. And God said this, My grace is sufficient for you. What's that telling me? God has given us everything we need. It's God's Spirit that sustains us. And then He goes on, My grace is sufficient for you for my Power is made perfect in your what? In your weakness. Listen, folks, there are going to be some tragedies that happen in our lifetime. And the response that all we need to do is be strong is a false response. Because we can't get through some things in life. There are some things that are too much for us to bear. And it's not because God has given us because we can handle it. As a matter of fact, when we come to the point of weakness, when we come to the point of facing the reality and the fact that we are mortal and we have limitations, when we say, God, I can't do this, I need you. It is the strength of God that's made perfect in our weakness. So if someone tells you you need to be strong, I want you to remember this message and think, no, I need to be weak. Because it's God's power that's made perfect in my weakness. And God has given me His grace, and His grace will sustain me. So that's, that's Paul's prayer. He, he, he's vulnerable. He shows us his prayer life. His prayer was a selfish prayer. He just had half the prayer. His prayer was, God, deliver me. But now you have to add the second half of the prayer. Lord, let your will be done. And, and part of that prayer, it can, it can look a lot of different ways. Part of that prayer can be, Lord... I can't do this on my own. I need you. Lord, I'm weak. I need your strength. Lord, I need you to help me through this. And so we have James, the brother of Jesus. He writes his letter. And James, uh, James says in his first chapter, he just sets it up right away. He's the leader of the Jerusalem church. He's watching the, the followers, the believers in Jesus Christ. He's watching them be persecuted. He's watching them be, be stoned. Uh, he saw Stephen be stoned in Acts chapter 7. And he writes a letter and he says, Take joy, brothers and sisters, whenever trouble comes. And I'm thinking, Oh, you've got to be kidding me. But I'm supposed to be happy when I'm suffering? What's going on with that? But that's not what James is saying. 
changes and says, Hey, I'm suffering. Let's do it together. But he does tell us two things. One, when we're going through something that we can't handle, our faith has to be in God. That's the first thing. And the second thing he says, he, he teaches us how to pray. He says, you need to pray. I love how he sets it up. If any of you lacks wisdom, pray for wisdom. Now, those of us who are strong, we don't need to pray for wisdom, right? Those of us who are smart, we don't need to pray for wisdom because we don't lack wisdom, right? That's called being puffed up, arrogant, and proud. So when we can admit the limitations that we have in both knowledge and spirit, then we pray for wisdom. Why would we pray? What, what kind of wisdom would we pray for? We pray for God's wisdom. What do we do? We look in the Scripture. We look and apply God's principles to our situation. And James says that when you apply faith and you pray for wisdom, that God gets us through the situation, and when we get through the situation, He's got this word He calls perseverance. We persevere. We don't persevere because of our strength. We persevere because of God's strength. We don't persevere because of our knowledge and how smart we are. We persevere because we surrender to the will of God and the knowledge of God and the plan of God. David was the king of Israel a thousand years before Christ, and before he was a king, he was a shepherd. And he writes maybe one of the most beautiful pieces of, it was a song, he wrote it as a song, one of the beautiful pieces of poetry that we know that thousands of people over the last 3,000 years have depended on and, and recited in times of trouble. And it starts out by saying, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, I lack for nothing. And he leads me beside green pastures, he leads me beside still waters, he restores my soul, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. We're thinking, what a wonderful scene, isn't that beautiful? God gives us peace when we follow him. But then comes verse 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Now, why do we have to go there? We were having such a good time in the peaceful valley and the peaceful waters and the path of righteousness. Why do we have to go to that valley of the shadow of death? We didn't have to go there. Did you know there was a real place geographically called the valley of the shadow of death? I saw it. Last month when I was in Israel, we drove this horrible road. We all thought we were going to be sick. Real windy road up a mountain. We got out. We looked around. Oh, there's a there's a Roman aqueduct. There's a ruin over there. And there's this pretty desperate place. And they take us over and they look. They make us look over this cliff. And they say, right there, you know what that is? I said, no, nah, it, it, yeah, it's a it's another valley. That is a valley of the shadow of death. It's a real place. And it's a dangerous place. And David said, even when i got to walk through that valley, I won't be afraid because God is with me. And my favorite word of that piece is the word through. God gets you through it. God gives you His strength. God gives you His grace to get you through it. And Lord, God, leave, folks. If you're walking through that valley... Don't stop. Don't stop in the valley and say, oh, I give up. I can't do it anymore. I'm just going to quit this stuff. No, no. That's, that's when you, that's when you uh, to sustain you, to get through the valley. And when you get through the valley, you're growing your faith. You know, it's not like you need a greater faith to go through the valley. But whatever faith you have is enough faith to get you through your difficult circumstances. Even if it's a very little faith or you have a great big faith, the amount of your faith is not what gets you through. The amount of God's grace and God's strength gets you through the valley. And once you get through the valley, your faith will be stronger because you've experienced the touch of God in your life. In the gospel, they describe Jesus walking in this 
what we call the Via Dolorosa, the way of the cross. The cross is put on his back, and he walks through the city streets. And there comes a point where he's too weak to carry the cross. And the Roman soldier gets Simon and Simon, you're going to carry the cross the rest of the way. And one of the things that tells me is that Jesus in his humanness did not have the physical strength to continue. Even Jesus needed help. And I want to say to you, don't think you have to suffer in isolation. Don't think you're the one that has to take it on your shoulders and be strong enough to make it through whatever it is. Even Jesus, with the physical limitations that he had, he needed help too. And when you refuse help or deny help or say, I don't need any help, that is a weak premise. You might think a lot of yourself, but God has put a community of people around you to pray for you, to encourage you, and to love you. And don't leave them out. Which then, and for the rest of us, if we're not going through a difficult time, are you encouraging? Are you loving? Are you praying for those who are going through a difficult situation? You know, I picked this scripture back in October. I did the whole year of 2016. Way back in October, I do the whole year. I do that every year. I have a theme. It's called The Way, The Discipleship Pathway. And then I break it up in the series. And because it's close to Easter, The Way of the Cross. And so I, I picked a scripture that wasn't in the Gospels, but it was, it was a witness of Paul to say, Paul went through some very difficult times and he never gave up. But he even, even witnessed death and came close to death himself and the persecution of death. Yet he still continued and in, in that sense wants to wants you to continue. And when I pick that in October, I never know what I'm going to be going through that particular week when the Scripture comes. And a week ago last Friday, my mother-in-law was in the hospital. She'd been in the hospital five days. The hospital was doing a great job. However, she was not improving. And Friday morning at 9.30, it became a perilous situation. And any of you who have gone through anything like that knew that um, things were, when things are not going well, sometimes the doctors come to you and say, this, here's some options that we have, you need to make a decision. Blood pressure was 220 over 49. Heart rate was 140. When they block blood oxygen level, which means that we'd like for it to be 100, uh, the alarm goes off. If it goes below 90, it would get below 60. And being in those hospital rooms with many of you in the last 26 years, I knew we were at a perilous point in our journey. And Rhonda's mom had said, I do not want to be put on a ventilator. And I knew, without a ventilator, that she had about two hours to live. And I saw my wife have faith and courage and love for her mom, forced with an impossible decision. And I like to say in those times, there is no right or wrong, there's only hard decisions to make. And it wasn't going to do any good for anyone to come in and say, just be strong, just have more faith. God won't give you more than you can handle. None of those were going to work in that hour. And she went to her mom and said, Mom, if we put you on the ventilator as treatment, you have a chance to make it. And if you refuse, you're not going to make it. And we were really okay with whatever decision that she made. There was no right or wrong, only a hard one to make. And so she chose the ventilator. And so we walked her on the ventilator for a week, wondering if she would ever come off. And this past Friday, she was able to come off the ventilator and breathe on her own again. 
But we know that we'll be faced with that decision again, with her or with someone else. And in those times, if I'm with you and I'm your pastor, I will say to you, let's ask God for His strength. Let's ask God for His wisdom. Do you love the person you're making this decision for? And if those three elements are in place, there is no right or wrong, only difficult decisions to make. You see, it would be easy to give up. It would be easy to walk away from that and say, I'm not going to make a decision. It would be easy to walk away from that and say, oh, I'm not going to do it. It's easy to pray and say, God, deliver me from this situation. Take this away from me. But there are going to be times in your life when you will not be rescued. But God will come along beside you. And God will love you. And God will say, I will never leave you or forsake you. And God will give you wisdom and courage to make difficult decisions in sometimes what seems the most dire of circumstances. But there is nothing that's going to happen in this world today that will surprise God. There's nothing that's going to happen in this world today that God cannot handle. And when our faith is in God and we rely on His strength, God will get us through each and every situation. Let us pray. Most holy God, we, uh, we come before you today. And we no longer are going to live under a false pretense. No longer do we come to you today and say that we are strong. No longer do we come to you today and say we have all the answers and we're wise enough. Instead, we come to you today in a time of weakness, in times of trouble, in times of difficulty, asking for your strength. Asking for your wisdom. And Lord, for the times we pray for rescue and you rescue us, we give you all the glory and the honor and the praise. But for times when you do not rescue us and we have to walk through that valley, we thank you that you don't leave us and that you sustain us in the midst of the most difficult circumstances. And Lord, I thank you for these people of Wesley Chapel. I thank you that you have surrounded us with people who love us, people who encourage us. And we pray, oh God, that we might also be loving and encouraging to our brothers and sisters in Christ. All of this is in your hands. And Lord, whether we live or whether we die, we are in your hands. We are your people. And may you sustain us, O God, that when we pick up that cross and follow you, that we will keep going. In Jesus' name, amen.